Emotional dysregulation. It's not the first thing people think of when it comes to ADHD, but it's a defining feature. So the question to explore today, is ADHD only about attention and hyperactivity, or does it involve deeper emotional processes that shape behavior and relationships? Welcome to Psychiatry Simplified. I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. This is the channel where we cover all things psychiatry, neuroscience, and mental health related. So if that's your thing, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay in touch with all our future videos. So today we are unpacking emotional dysregulation ADHD, and we're also connecting emotional dysregulation to the overlaps with borderline personality disorder and rejection sensitive dysphoria. In the world of mental health, terms like ADHD, BPD, and RSD can blur together, sometimes adding confusion rather than clarity. Are we dealing with a simple disorder of attention or is it something more complex? Understanding the overlap of emotional dysregulation in these conditions can reveal why these diagnoses often seem to collide. So let's start off first with the construct of ADHD. And what does ADHD, when broken down, look like? So when we think about the ADHD domains, we've got the domains of cognition, which is executive dysfunction. We have activity, where we think about hyperactivity. We've got reward sensitivity. Now we know one of the core issues in ADHD is the response to reward. Here, if I want to simplify it, it's essentially the individuals primed towards immediate gratification as opposed to delayed gratification. That's the reward sensitivity. Then we've got behavioral activation, motivation, and this behavioral activation is driven by the arousal pathways. In other words, if we didn't have arousal or drive, we would have no action. Next, we've got behavioral inhibition because one of the key functions of the prefrontal cortex is to inhibit this limbic arousal, which is known as emotional regulation. So when we think about these domains here, they constitute to a certain extent emotional regulation and behavioral inhibition is part of impulse control, the ability of the prefrontal cortex to inhibit impulses that arise from the amygdala or the limbic arousal. And then we have the fight and flight system. So the fight and flight system we know is part of the trauma-related, fear-related responses, again, mediated from the limbic system. So if we think about ADHD just based on these domains, we can see here that cognition, activity, and reward sensitivity, the hedonic drive and the responses to reward, are one part of the condition, but this part constitutes the emotional world of the individual, which exists in every single human being. So let's look at what this looks like from a neuroscience perspective, because from a neuroscience perspective, this isn't surprising. The fact that emotional dysregulation or emotional regulation forms a core part of ADHD and is such an important part in the treatment of ADHD. So when we look at the neuroscientific perspective, the frontostriatal limbic circuits play a crucial role in ADHD. These are transdiagnostic. So we know that the frontal cortex, to simplify it, particularly the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is a seat of executive function. This is connected to the striatum the striatum mediates activity. And this striatum and the prefrontal cortex is connected to the amygdala, which is the limbic pole. So essentially, we've got three components, three loops. One, the affective loop. Here we can see that the connections between the nucleus accumbens and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or the orbitofrontal cortex forms the limbic loop. Here we have the top-down inhibition that plays an important role in emotional control. We have the cognitive loop, which we of course know we try to modulate the executive function in ADHD. And then we have the motor loop. But essentially, these three are connected and therefore emotional regulation is part of ADHD. Frontal striatal limbic circuits form the basis of cognition, activity, emotion, perception, and sleep. In ADHD, what we're trying to do is to strengthen the frontostriatal circuits to improve emotional dysregulation. 
and this is manifested in the form of improved attention, improved concentration, and better emotional control. We also know that there are certain subtypes where emotional dysregulation is more prominent. For example, in females, the predominant model of ADHD is an arousal model compared to males who have a delayed lateralization model or a developmental deviation model. So we know that these differences need to be taken into account in the diagnosis and management of ADHD. So when we think about emotional dysregulation, this stems from the hyperactivity in the striatal circuits, which are deeply connected to the arousal pathways. So in some individuals, this arousal may be manifested through the striatal expression, which is hyperactivity because striatum is the movement area. But in other individuals, it can be manifested through emotional dysregulation, the difficulty in controlling emotions. The key aspect here is for both of these expressions, the underlying neurobiological principle remains emotional arousal. So therefore, there is no activity without arousal. In ADHD, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral pathways are not only intertwined, but rely on each other. And it's for us clinicians to take a broader approach addressing each one of these in management. And I'll give you a really good example of how in ADHD treatment at times, a stimulant is prescribed to improve cognition and activity, but the emotional dimensions aren't. How can I examine that? By examining sleep. You see, in ADHD, there is a very high comorbidity with sleep dysfunction. I've written a paper here, ADHD and sleep disorders, which covers the range of sleep disorders, importantly, touching on the neurobiology as well. On the academy, we have the precision sleep medicine course and the neuropsychiatry of sleep as well. So if you want to take a broader approach to the management of ADHD, then check out the curriculum on ADHD, 19 and a half hours, and connect it to other conditions such as insomnia, sleep dysregulation, PMDD even, which is a manifestation of emotional arousal. These are just some examples of how we need to take a broader approach in addressing these conditions. So with that foundation in mind, let's look at how emotional dysregulation appears in ADHD and why is it such a core component of this condition. The reason why the emotional development is such a core part of ADHD is because both of them start with neurodevelopment and the shaping of personality. You see, early in life, when the prefrontal cortex, the brain's regulatory control center, is still maturing, children primarily express themselves through the limbic system, i.e. through an emotional expression. So a young child might say, Mom, my tummy hurts. I think I did something bad. You see, they don't use the word, I'm guilty. They simply highlight a somatic expression with a action. So what we see here is a physical response to an emotional need. As children grow older, these somatic expressions give way to cognitive explanations. So instead of the child saying, my tummy hurts, they might say, I feel guilty. I hurt X, Y, Z. And they understand what action to take, like apologizing. Over time, these emotional expressions and responses become automatic. And this is what we call personality development, which is essentially the development of our emotional and behavioral language. The patterns of behavior as defined by the patterns of emotional expression. And thus in adults, sorry, as part of the individual's personality becomes second nature. So now that we've looked at the construct of ADHD and the various domains, the construct of emotion and its importance in shaping personality, but also how both neurodevelopment and emotional development occur at the same time, now we can understand RSD and borderline personality disorder better. And we can also understand why there's this debate as to whether this is BPD or RSD or ADHD. We don't need to split it. We can simply integrate it because ultimately all three are mediated by the frontostriatal limbic circuits. Every single human being has these circuits. The labels are terms given to certain phenomena to help us make sense of the patient's experience. So let's take RSD first, rejection sensitive dysphoria. RSD isn't a formal diagnosis, 
but is a specific phenomenon where people, often those with ADHD or even in other conditions, experience an intense, overwhelming emotional reaction to perceived rejection. Now, this heightened response is rooted in the amygdala, the brain's emotional center, threat center, fear center. So we know that individuals with ADHD, due to a range of reasons, difficulties in childhood, in academic life, criticality from the external environment, etc., can result in a heightened level of amygdala activation because each experience of rejection results in a phenomenon of sensitization, which means that the emotional impact continues to become heightened over time. And what it does is it embeds an increasing sensitivity to future rejection. This is the phenomenon of sensitization. Let's look at what borderline personality disorder entails. You see, borderline personality disorder shares some symptoms with ADHD, such as, say, impulse discontrol, emotional dysregulation. Individuals with borderline personality disorder can have ADHD as well. They can also have rejection sensitive dysphoria, and we'll see why. But the origins may be different. The reason for this overlap is that in borderline personality disorder as well, we see significant frontal limbic dysfunction, an overactive limbic system combined with an underperforming prefrontal cortex. This combination leads to intense emotional reactivity to perceive rejection or negative interactions, which has roots in early social and emotional development. The key here is that borderline personality disorder also has developmental origins, just like ADHD does. In fact, there is evidence from neuroimaging studies that positive feedback in borderline personality disorder can result in arousal and can be interpreted as distressing. There is also evidence that individuals with borderline personality disorder afford a greater precision or a greater weighting to negative stimuli or negative experiences and find it more challenging to update this information based on newer information that arises. So the emotional dysregulation borderline personality disorder is more embedded arising from developmental experiences rather than isolated reactions. And you can imagine that heightened amygdala activity over an extended period of time as part of neurodevelopment results in the construct of BPD because it results in heightened emotional reactivity, impulse dysregulation because of decreased top-down inhibition, self-identity dysfunction due to a range of reasons because it's difficult to integrate the positives and the negatives. There is a greater weighting of the negative due to amygdala sensitization. So we can see how the construct of BPD is developed from a neurodevelopmental perspective as well. So I've written two articles on borderline personality disorder, one here on the neurobiology and psychodynamics, and two on the diagnosis and management of BPD using these principles. So now if we take a step back and ask ourselves, why do symptoms of ADHD, RSD, and BPD seem so similar? Well, it's largely due to neurodevelopment. Emotional language, cognition, and behavior grow together, which is why we see overlaps. In ADHD, especially in females, we know females tend to have a greater amygdala sensitivity. Emotional dysregulation is common due to the involvement of the frontostriatal limbic circuits. Emotional reactivity isn't just an extra feature. It's embedded in the disorder. It's part and parcel of the disorder. So now that we understand this, is it ADHD? Is it BPD? Well, it could be both. Research actually suggests four primary explanations for why ADHD and BPD often co-occur. And note that within this, RSD can also occur, but RSD is a narrower phenomenon. The first reason, ADHD may serve as a developmental antecedent to BPD, where early emotional dysregulation ADHD evolves into broader patterns seen in BPD. Two, both conditions may share foundational neurobiological mechanisms, making them two sides of the same coin, which is essentially the prefrontal cortex dysfunction and heightened amygdala activity. Third, ADHD and BPD could be distinct, but share overlapping risk factors. Fourth, one disorder may increase the vulnerability to the other over time. And there is a fifth hypothesis as well, that ADHD might even be a subtype within the BPD spectrum. So these perspectives highlight the shared neurodevelopmental roots 
and the complex ways in which these conditions interact. Understanding these connections between emotional dysregulation, ADHD, RSD, and BPD reveals that focusing on one isolated symptom or label can be limiting. We ultimately want to understand the entire patient experience. With RSD, for instance, we can see only one aspect of how the brain responds to emotional pain, which was rejection. A broader approach to management that addresses both calming the amygdala and strengthening the top-down regulation is often more effective. This is where a biopsychosociocultural diet lifestyle approach becomes beneficial. So to summarize, labels like ADHD, BPD, and RSD can be helpful and they're necessary, but it's important to recognize that these labels do not encompass the entire human experience. The real insight comes from understanding the neurobiology. Getting back to first principles, the intricate pathways linking emotion, cognition, and behavior, including perception and sleep. By moving beyond diagnostic categories and focusing on the underlying processes, we can offer a more comprehensive approach to managing emotional dysregulation. So I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked the video, don't forget to leave us a like and of course, subscribe to our channel to stay in touch with all our future videos. A big thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay curious. Bye-bye.